Okay, how many of you, uh, let's see, two weeks ago, this was a two-parter for me. We're in a series called Removing the Mask. How many of you were here two weeks ago when I spoke? Can I see your hands? How many of you weren't? Where were you? <laughs> Just kidding, that would be shaming. Uh, we're not doing that. We're talking about how to remove that. Everybody wears a mask, uh, some, some form of a mask. It's culturally, you know, since the beginning of time, every culture wears masks. They do it for intimidation. They do it for entertainment. Uh, they do it to hide. Uh, they do it to impress. They do it to sometimes uh, make themselves scarier before a war. So, you know, every culture, it's not new. There's no cultures that don't wear a mask. I think America has perfected the art of mask wearing. I think about Jesus' words, which are, you know, comforting and terrifying when he looked at religious leaders. And he said, you know, you clean the outside of the cup. But inside, you're full of dead man's bones. In other words, there's a gap between how you present yourself and what's really going on on the inside. Jesus has always been about bridging the gap between those two places. The reality of who we are deep down that nobody knows, the hidden part of us, and how we present ourselves. And I want you to marry a word today, all right? The word is congruence. Everybody say congruence. We're going to get to that in a few minutes, but by way of a quick recap, you know, we talked about creation. We talked about the fact that when God created Adam and Eve, it says that they're, and it says this, they were naked and not ashamed. It's okay to use the N word, naked. They were naked. They were not ashamed. And I think they, it says that, you know, and when you think about that, what does that mean? It means that they had no guilt. They had no shame. There was no hiddenness with them. There was only pure authenticity with them. There was no uh, disconnectment from God. There was no disconnection from each other. There was this relationship that was whole and, and, and full of integrity. Uh, there wasn't any separation. All, this, and, you know, all these things, there was no dejection. There was no anxiety because anxiety and dejection always go with shame, but they hadn't sinned, so there was none of that. There was, there was just all this thing called congruence, and I would say that that's what Jesus is after right here. When, when, you, when you bump into the state of where you feel like you're totally you know, one with God, you're in harmony with relationship, you're not hiding from each other, you're not pretending, you're not trying to impress each other, you're, 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 you, you are as you really are in relationships, there's no guilt, no shame, no hiddenness, no anxiety. You know you're tapping into the reconciliation of Jesus. That's what he's doing right now. He is, the Bible says he is re reconciling all things right now. If you want to know what he's doing, he's reconciling that in you, that gap that you have, that gap that I have. And so there was this perfect creation. There was a tempter. There was a temptation. There was a seduction. Won't go into that. Go back and, and listen to the whatever they call it. Is it online? I was going to say CD. I wouldn't old. I almost said cassette, man, and then you know, and then eight track, and there would have been like five of us in here. Yeah, eight tracks rock. Um, go back and watch on TV or <laughs> online or whatever you call it, online. Yeah, and and so because I don't want to go, you know, I don't want to do this. Uh, I want to get to what I want to get to. But the main thing was that they sinned, they disobeyed, and then all of a sudden they were uncovered. And and I said a couple weeks ago, I believe their coverings was the glory of God. That's how they were clothed. You know, that's what, that's what it says in Matthew 17 when Jesus, Peter, and John, and James went up the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, it says uh, his face shone like the sun and his garments were, were white and his clothes were glorious. You know, I believe that state right there. I believe that's what Adam and Eve had. They were just clothed with glory. And then when they sinned and rebelled and disobeyed, then they were uncovered and then they were aware of things that they weren't supposed to be aware of. And so then they hid which is, once again, the futility of this is, is just amazing. They hid from God, okay? So you're going to hide from the creator, dumb. You're going to cover yourself. You're going to cover your nakedness with your own little creation of fig leaves, dumb. You know, you're going to hide from God like he's not going to see you. Um, it's just ridiculous, you know? It's futile. But yet you and I do the same thing. It's just as futile today as it was back then. And so they did that. And then, of course, God comes looking for them which is what God does with lost people. He looks for them. And you know what he says? Scripture says, he says, come out, come out, wherever you are. 
Well, that's probably a loose paraphrase, but it's in there somewhere. That's what he does. He's seeking that which is lost. There's parables that are devoted. There's four stories in Luke 15 that all talk about things and people and stuff that gets lost and the radical search to find them. And then the celebration rejoicing when things are found. So let me just say, if you're a little lost right now, you know you can be lost in church, right? (laughs) Hopefully you're not lost because of church. You can be lost in church as lost as the older brother was even in his obedience with his prodigal brother. Problem was, he was lost and didn't know it. But he looked so good. No, he looked so good. I did all this. I did all this. No, man, he missed it. He was lost. His lostness looks different. Your lostness looks a little different than my lostness. Let me just say, if you're a little lost, God's looking for you. Jesus is looking for you. I'm, I'm thoroughly, like, so excited you have no idea. What happens is sin introduces shame. Here's by definition what shame is. It's a self-conscious emotion. Shame informs us of an internal state of inadequacy, unworthiness, dishonor, regret, disconnection, and insecurity. Now, if we're just going to get real, pretend this is a support group. (laughs) My name's Bob, and I'm inadequate, unworthy, dishonored, regret, disconnected, flawed, and insecure. And you'd say... Hi, Bob. (laughs) And you wouldn't leave me up here by myself because as recovery groups go, it's your turn at some time. So wouldn't we all agree that those things that I just mentioned, you feel like that sometimes. That's shame. That's shame. Now, nobody goes around and says that. Hey, what's new? Oh, man, I'm just feeling really insecure, inadequate, flawed, full of regrets, disconnected from people. How are you doing? Nobody does that. So we just let it lie dormant. We don't talk about it. But that shame, I'll tell you this, is a driver. It'll drive you. It'll drive you to keep it hidden. It'll drive you into pretense. It'll drive you into hiding. That's what, that's what shame does. Shame will, will, will say you are bad and will, will identify your personhood and your identity with that thing that happened either to you or the thing that you did. That's shame. Now, isn't it true that in God's creation, Adam and Eve were approved by God? It's not a trick question. Were they approved by God? At least that's what the word says. God created them and said, this is blessed. That's approval. Could they have ever gotten more approved from God? No. No, there's not like, okay, do these four things, I'll give you a double dose of approval. No, because their inherent approval was, was inherent to the perfectness and holiness of God. It had nothing to do with what they did. It was relationship only. That's all there was, was relationship. There was no... There was no You can't get what you already have. The problem with us is most of us don't feel approved by God, so we go looking for approval elsewhere. And we do it a lot of different ways, and we're creative, and and we try. We try. In fact, I would say, I, I can't tell you, it's not scientific, but I can't tell you what percentage of religious works are probably a feeble attempt to get approval from God. The problem is the approval for you from God has come through Jesus, not you. Yes, thank God for that. But yet we all do this. God was great and good, and they were blessed. Isn't it interesting how after they sinned, God didn't change? See, we always think God changed. God did not change. Their perception of God changed. That's that's all that changed, their perception. I would say we suffer on some level to a distorted perception of God a lot. (laughs) I couldn't think of another word, so it was the Hebrew word, a lot. (laughs) It was a lot. (laughs) And that sound good. Now, once again, I don't know what part you're going to get here, but I believe you're going to get something. I believe you're going to get a nugget. 
I want you to think about your creation. I want you to think about Psalm 100. Psalm 100, verse 3. This is beautiful. Let's read it together. Ready? Know that the Lord... Selah, 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 pause, meditate. Know by experience that the Lord, he is God. The creator, the covenant maker, the covenant keeper, he is God. It is he who made us. Who made you? Did you make yourself? Did other people make you? Do people's approval of you make you or unmake you? Do your accomplishments make you? Do your possessions make you? Do your letters after your, what do they call it, degree? <laughs> Thank you. Wow. You can always tell the guy that's been to four community colleges and a defunct Bible college without, without letters after his name. Did you go to college? Four of them. What's your degree in? <laughs> really? <laughs> this verse, boy, I... I I'm not going to get a tattoo. Man, what the heck are you doing back there? <laughs> I'm not going to get a tattoo, probably. But if I did, it might be this one. He is God, period. You're not. Oh. It is he who made us. Ah. Made in the U.S. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was so hokey. That was good, corny. I'm sorry. I'm taking that to Pakistan with me. Not. But once again, just see this. It's, he's God. He made us. We didn't make ourselves. You can't make yourself. You can't make yourself. The only thing you can do is be content with who God made you to be. You can worship him because he made you. He created you. She gets it. <laughs> We're his people. That's it, man. Sons and daughters of God. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power, and the authority to be called sons of God, daughters of God. It's all on him. you got to get this. It's all on God. It's all through Jesus. It's all by the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, it's period. That's it. You can't add to that. This is good. So what does shame look like? Here's what shame looks like. Here's how people respond to it. I'm just going to rip through this list real quick. See if you relate to any of this. We wear masks to hide and cover up our weaknesses, scars, and failures. Contrast this with Jesus, who upon his resurrection shared his scars, showed his scars. Isn't that interesting that when Jesus raises from the dead, appears to his disciples, he doesn't go, oh, don't look at that part. He said, look. And he said, reach. Touch my wounds. How do we get healing? We touch his wounds. This, this is powerful. Man, I'm going to get rid of this barber chair. I don't know what that is. It, I sat on, a, on the first service. It was like, what the heck? I flashed back to it. I was like, kid, no, don't cut that. <laughs> Crazy. So Jesus showed his scars. Now think about this. Jesus had no untouchables. Okay, so when Jesus encountered lepers with leprosy, did he tolerate them and pray for them from a distance? Or did he come close and touch them? Now, I know sin causes that, ugh, Jesus, ugh, don't come too close. But let me ask you, if Jesus touches, your view of God has got to be rooted right here. If Jesus touched lepers... If lepers were untouchable, do you honestly think he would shy away 
from your shame? I think not. No, I think, I think Jesus has been touching unclean people for a long time. That means you. That means me. He does that. And you say, well, you don't know. Yeah, I do know. You're diabolical. You got sin. I know. This is the 11 o'clock service. I get it. Totally. <laughs> of which I'm a part. <laughs> I doubt you're going to be the first person that has done so much bad that he won't touch you. I, I just, I fail to see it. I, I, there's just no way. I'm too convinced. If he isn't touching untouchables, I'm not going to another part of the world because I got nothing to offer them. But Jesus is God incarnate in the flesh who didn't preach a message from heaven but came as one of us in perfection and love and healing and grace and mercy and forgiveness. I love that. But we hide. Isn't it interesting? The Hebrew word translated uncleanness means nakedness or shame. So when you ask lepers, what are you feeling? They would have said nakedness and shamed. Number two, second response. We try to appear better than we are. We show the good. We hide the bad. I had a great talk with Anthony Sanoa uh, a couple months ago, and we were sitting in this uh, little dive breakfast joint. We were talking about life, and I was talking about, I said, isn't it interesting, when you look at all of life, everybody's life, it's, it's full of wins and losses. Isn't that true? Success and failures, right? Obedience and disobedience. Grief and heartache and sadness and celebration and joy. And I just, you know, times of prosperity, times of you know, just lack and shortage and times of, you know, wow, walking in obedience with Jesus and other times of like, wow, am I the most depraved guy on the planet? And just, I went down this whole list back, just back and forth. You know, we were just talking and I just said, you know, if you take away, you know, if you only live on this side of the ledger, all those positives and you don't, and you take away all the negative things, what do you have? And he said, Facebook. Just that quick he said that. I thought, isn't that profound? Isn't that true? <laughs> social media, man. Did you know 60% of the people on social media lie? <laughs> I don't even know why that's funny. 60% <laughs> of the people lie. More than half, 50 per, 56% of millennials Say they've posted a photo on social media to make it look like they were staying, eating, or visiting somewhere more expensive than they actually were. <laughs> now, right now, some of you little millennials are thinking I'm bagging on the millennials, but I'm not. Because the reason older people don't show up on this study is because they don't actually know how to use social media. <laughs> so if they did, and they're not going to ask their kid, hey, show me how to... Make this little thing I got going right here. Oh, yeah, let me show you. So we don't go there. But isn't that interesting? And then here's the reason in this study, a 1,000 people. The reason was, get this, it wasn't just to look good. It was to create jealousy. The reason was to create jealousy and make themselves appear more desirable. So I'm not content enough with, think, you know, you thinking, wow, he's got a really good life. He's living his best life now. No, I want to create jealousy. When you look at a picture of me, you go, oh, I hate him. I hate his life. I wish I had his life. How can he live like that? Isn't that just warped? That is so warped. You buy a six-ounce steak, and you blow up the picture. 24-ounce steak. Biggest steak you ever saw this side of Mississippi. And you can actually, okay, this, you can actually go online and look at Pictures people have, have, have uh, falsified. To, to, I mean, and it's hysterical. <laughs> One guy's taking a picture. He goes, the sun's so bright today, man. I can hardly see. <laughs> Guy replies back to him and says, dude, the shadow, <laughs> the, the sun's in your face, not in, in your back. So he had this stage thing. Anyways, you had to be there. Um, <laughs> but here's how bent we are. Probably got it all back. Anyways. Um, so... So we try to look good. We try to impress. 
Once again, it's the, the shame. Shame is the driver. So here's, here's what they did. In L.A., like in Beverly Hills, Hollywood or something, they did this thing where they created this fake store, a fake shoe store. And they called it like Paliz. Is that what it was? No, 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 no. Not yet. Not yet. Paliz. And it was like a fancy name. And then they put columns. And it was ritzy. And it was opulent. And they said it was this like, you know, really cool store. And they priced all the shoes at like three, four, five, six hundred dollars. But what they did was they stocked it with Payless shoes. Because they wanted to see would people, based on image and appearance of the store, come in and actually, and they did, and, they, and you can see, watch this video. People come in there, oh, yeah, this is some fine leather. Oh, I'd pay $500 for this. You know, it's Payless, man. It's like $18.99. <laughs> but isn't that just interesting that how we just, we just were so seducible. We want to look good. We want to be posh. We're wearing Payless shoes. <laughs> Imitation leather, not even real, man. That's part of shame. You know, there's actually a term on Wikipedia called insta-lie. Insta-lie. An intention, intentionally false representation of real life on social media. Sad. Here's a great quote. No man for any considerable period can wear one face to himself and another to the multitude without finally getting bewildered as to which may be true. The problem with incongruence, the problem with you and I presenting ourselves as something that we're not is eventually deception takes over and you don't know who you are. Am I my image? Am I my shame? Am I what? What am I? Who am I? And I'll tell you, it's a lot more common than you would ever realize. You lie and you pretend and, and you wear one face and you're somebody else. And after a while, it's like, man, you look in the mirror one day and you go, I don't even know who I am. That's incongruence. Okay, here we go, man. We are, we are moving. We're moving. So congruence. Once again, go to Jesus. I quoted it two weeks ago. John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way. Everybody say, the way. The, way. the, truth. the truth. The life. The life. That's it. That's your life. You want to know what your life is? That's it right there. In Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, let me ask you a question. Was Jesus humiliated? Was Jesus shamed? Was Jesus abandoned? Was Jesus rejected? Spit on? Mocked publicly? Shamed publicly, right? Okay. If that happened to him, and you deal with some of those same things right there, you have to ask yourself, what did he do? That's your reference point. The reference point is when Jesus experienced those things that I feel right here, what did he do? And I'll tell you what he did. He walked through it. He walked through it. Okay? So here's the verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, I think verse 23. It says that when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile back. Okay? but instead kept entrusting himself to the one God who judges rightly. So what do you do with all that stuff? What do you do with all that stuff on the inner gut, deep down, that shame? You walk through it. You're not going to be paralyzed. You're going to come right to Jesus. You're going to walk through it with Jesus. You're going to let him touch it. You're going to invite him in. You're going to open your heart to him. You're going to open your emotions to him. And you're going to have him give you an assessment of what he thinks. And you know what he's going to say? I want to heal that. Yeah. I want to heal that. And once again, Jesus as our my Savior, Son of God, Messiah. Personally, those are mine. He's, he's mine. But he said he's the truth. And I love, I love part of the definition of the truth. No opacity. There was nothing opaque about Jesus. You never wondered like, well, hey, what do you think he's really like? No, what you saw is what you got. That's why he could speak the truth without any fear of anybody. You want the truth? Here's the truth. My feelings are hurt. Oh, well, it's still the truth. Repent. That's the truth. I love you. Let me heal you. That's the truth. See, you can't segment 
different parts and attributes of Jesus. You have to take him as the whole. He's, he's the whole Lord. He's the whole Savior. He's the whole Creator. He's the whole reconciler. reconciler. He, he's, he's whole. And that's where we find our wholeness. Our, our wholeness is in him. Hebrews 4.13, 11. Before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked. There's that naked word again. What the heck? <laughs> Who's naked? Yeah. Person sitting right next to you. Don't look. <laughs> all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of one to whom we must render an account. Let me ask you a question. If there's nothing hidden, why hide? <laughs> if nothing's hidden, why hide? Hiding today before a creator that sees all is as futile as it was back then in Genesis 2. It doesn't work. It will never work. It has never worked. We come to him as we are. Now, the word congruence, this is, I love this word. The word congruence means I meet together. I agree. Covenant. Meet together. And right away I think of Isaiah. We meet together. Prophet said, come let us reason together. I love that. Come let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. I love that. It's like, let's sit down and talk about the condition. Let's sit down and talk about sin. Let's talk about this condition. Let's, let's reconcile this thing. Let's talk about this. Let's have an honest, self-disclosing discussion about the condition of your life. Open yourself up. I think that's absolutely transformational. It's incredible. I think about, you know, who was the hardest people for Jesus to reach? The religious Pharisees. You know why? Because they didn't think they had any issues. They did all these things. In fact, Jesus even commended them on some points. They said, you know, do what they say. Don't do what they live. So the words were truthful. Their lives didn't match up right then. So to me, I mean, I, I think about this congruence and meeting together, and I think, about, I think about 1 John, where it says, everybody sins. Isn't that true? Everybody misses the mark. Is there anybody in here you haven't sinned? Exactly. We sin. You sin. If any man says he doesn't sin, he's a deceiver. He's deceived. That's a deceptive thought. I don't, I don't sin. Oh, you got to be kidding me. No, he says, but when you sin, not if you sin, when you sin, confess. The blood of Jesus cleanses us continually. Now, let me just say this. I don't confess sin to be forgiven because I'm already forgiven in Christ. I, I am. When I came to Christ, my sin, it, it's gone. I mean, it's gone. Well, wait a minute, but you just said you still sin. Yeah, I still sin, but I'm not a sinner. I still sin. So when I confess, I'm not confessing to get forgiven again and again and again and again and again. I'm just letting God know that I know what he knows. I'm coming to agreement. You, you, saw, you saw that, right? <laughs> you heard that, right? Yeah, well, I, I just want you to know that I'm aligning myself with the truth and have mercy on me. It's already a forgiven deal. It's, see, here's the deal. Confession isn't for God. It's for you. It is. He's not going, man, they missed one about 27 years ago. They didn't confess it. I, I, what am I going to do with that? No, seriously, there's some people that think. He's like, I, 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 and so, anyways, I don't even want to go down that road. All right, I'm sorry. I just, I, let's get wound up. Let's, ushers, come on forward. Let's have communion. This stuff is, is so stirring to me. I believe every word of what I've told you. I seriously do. I love what Tim Keller says. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. 
Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. That's congruence. That's the truth. Congruence isn't that you don't sin. Congruence is, I do, I did, I did this, but this is who you are, and this is who you are in me, and there's harmony. Hypocrisy is the pretense of wearing the mask and pretending. When you come to God and say, I screwed up, I did this, I said that, did you hear that? Oh my, uh, uh, that's congruent. You see it, I see it, I acknowledge it, you know it. Thank you, God. I think it's a great way to live. It's a great way to live. So once again, we go to Jesus. Thank you, Steve. Role model for my beard. Once again, you look at Jesus. You don't need to look any further. Here's what congruence looks like in Jesus' life. Just think about how this applies to yourself. When Jesus was sad, what did he do? He cried. He wept. Isn't that true? That's congruence. Totally sad. Totally grieving. I'm crying. My emotions are matching the situation. There's no incongruence there. When Jesus was happy, he laughed. He smiled. He went to parties and was not afraid to have a good time. Are you sure you should say that? When you get accused of being a drunkard and a glutton, you're hanging out somewhere. You're, you're doing something. I don't think Jesus was sneaking in the back door of the club. I don't. I think he walked in the party. He walked into places. Most religious people didn't think he should go. And he said, let's have a little chat about redemption. <laughs> let's have a little chat about mercy. I, that's, that's, that's the Jesus I see. This is scriptures. When he was scared, this is his humanity, folks. He prayed. He knew he needed help. He was willing to ask his Father in heaven for help. When Jesus needed others, he asked his friends for help. He was going to the Garden of Gethsemane or the Garden of Agony or more realistically, the Garden of Intimacy. Because when you're the most squeezed, that's the time that you can experience closeness from God that only he understands. So what did Jesus, he needed others. He asked them, hey, help, pray. I want you to pray for me. When he was disappointed with them, mm, this isn't on the notes. When he was disappointed with them, did he pretend he wasn't? No. He expressed his disappointment. Came back, they're sleeping. Hey, pray for me. You got it. And what did he say? Couldn't, couldn't you guys, I mean, I'm going to the cross, you couldn't, like, like one hour you couldn't pray? I love it. He didn't hide his disappointment. Sometimes we think being Christianly is we hide our disappointment. No. If somebody disappoints you, tell them. You're not reckless, not harsh. You know, just say, hey, you know what? I just want you to know I was a little disappointed because you said this and you did this. That's all. I love you. I forgive you. That's congruent. Not, I'm really offended at you. Hey, brother, hey, how you doing? Yeah, it's good. It's all good. And you got an offense down there? Ooh, no good. Jesus saw people who needed a friend. He hung out with them. He wasn't afraid of what others might think. It's all congruence, and there's a lot more. That's what you want. That's what, that's what I want. I want to I be a man. What you see is what you get. I think that's just a good, a good way to live like Jesus. We need him, though. <laughs> this isn't, I'm going to be more congruent. I'm going to try harder. No, 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 no. This is God. This is what your word says. You also see the weakness of my flesh. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be congruent. Close the gap. Close the gap.
So part of healing from this thing called shame is vulnerability. Got to be vulnerable with Jesus, who you are. Invite him in. Invite him in. Just open your, just open up, God. You see it all. Help me. You see that thing. So then you got people that have been wounded and there's been shame. Then you got people that have wounded others. And you stuff that thing. And I'll just say there's mercy for you. There's help for you. There's hope for you. But I would say, you open yourself to God. And then you ask God to bring safe people into your life. Here's who I think are safe people. I don't always get it right, but for me, here's my grid. My grid for close relationships are, if it's not reciprocal, it's not a relationship. Meaning, I don't share all my weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and then you tell me how many times you walked on water. That's not going to fly. No, 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 no. Typically, those type of people you can't trust. But somebody clothed in humility, I can trust that person. That's just my grid. Never let me down. Doesn't mean I haven't been burned a time or two. That's, yeah, that's fine. There was, let me close with this. I was in a group years ago up in Washington. Just a small group. We met every Tuesday at this great little restaurant right on the Puget Sound. It was, it was a dive, but it was cool. It was right on the water. And every week we'd share and stuff. There was one guy in our group. And I don't know, for whatever reason... I I mean, it was shame and it was all this kind of stuff and more, but he would only tell you how many times God was speaking to him. All these incredible stories of how God, you know, I mean, mean, seriously, it was like he was in the third heaven all the time and once in a while he would come down to eat, you know? I mean, seriously, it was was like that. And, you know, and everybody's scratching your head. And, you know, when when you're that much of a pretender, it's funny, everybody sees it but you. And, and one time, in a moment of vulnerability, he said, hey, you guys, you know, I just want you to know, if you see anything in my life that doesn't line up with the word, you call me on it. You ever see Shark Week? <laughs> I mean, there was guys licking their chops, man, because... <laughs> It was go time. This one guy who was, he was actually a counselor, and he was a Vietnam vet, had seen a lot of stuff, and he was a gentle giant. He was just a very compassionate, kind guy. And he said, well, Joe, not his real name. And he pointed out something, and it was really in love and everything. And this guy took his fist, pounded the table in the middle of this restaurant, and went off. And I'm sitting here thinking, you just missed one of the best opportunities in your history to come out of the spiritual hiding and pretending, and you really could have got something here, but he wouldn't, would not do it. Because that's what shame does. You get defensive, you know? Would you agree you have blind spots? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. I got to catch a plane, but I love you. <laughs> um, New Year's Day, my wife and I are having breakfast, and she pulls the, hey, do you mind if I kind of call you out on your anger? What are you talking about? (laughs) What are you talking about? And she goes, no, you know, and my wife is like, if I can't trust my wife, I can't trust anybody. She always brings stuff pretty gracefully, just tender. She goes, I said, I don't, I don't have an anger problem. She goes, on the golf course. I go, no, no. She goes, well, your friends say you do. I said, well, those are my ex-friends. And they're called rats. So there I am, man, with a kind, compassionate woman, and I'm all defensive. And then I calmed down and realized that, man, if I can't trust her, I have to trust her. I said, you know what? It's just hard to hear, you know? And then I gave her all this reason. 
I'm real competitive, and you know what you don't do? You got to let all these emotions out so it doesn't. And she just sat there, you know. Like, yeah. Denial's not your friend, honey. Okay. Now, what is it? Now, what, what is it? You would just kind of reject that and be defensive. It's like shame somewhere back there, just whatever, wanting to look good, especially for my wife, you know. And so I said, okay. I said, you will not, you will not hear anything about that this year. I will prove to you. It's not an issue. Now, I've only golfed twice this year, but I'm two for two. But now what I do is, <laughs> this is bad, man. <laughs> One of my friends lost it and took his golf club and beat his friend's bag. And I videoed it. <laughs> and then I, I sent it to my wife. And I said, hey, just want you to know, our friend James, his real name, <laughs> would you just look at what he's doing? But not me, honey. Because I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. Got peace like a river in my soul. Where? In my soul. And then you know what? Making somebody else look bad doesn't help your issue. I get these brilliant thoughts. You have no idea. They just keep coming about once a year. All right. Let's hold the bread. We're just celebrating what Jesus did. Man, he came from heaven. He traded in our unrighteousness for his righteousness. There's no better deal in the history of mankind that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Wow. We could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, let me just ask you a question. If anything I said today resonated in your heart, in the area of shame, and you know that there's a deeper work God wants to do, would you just acknowledge that? Just hold the wafer up. Yeah, I, I hope and I pray that you have faith to trust Jesus more today. So, Father, we take this bread. Boy, we took, you, you took it all on you on that cross for us. You despised the shame. You endured the mistreatment of man, the hostility. But yet on your lips on the cross, there was nothing but forgiveness. So, God, we acknowledge forgiveness through the body of Jesus, healing through the woundedness of Jesus. And we're grateful sons and daughters of God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take the bread. It's hard to live in Christ and simultaneously live in shame. And I love Hebrews, I think it's nine, how God through the eternal spirit offered Jesus once as a sacrifice for all. And the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience. Ooh, everybody say my conscience cleanses our consciences from acts that led to dead works. Wow. Will you just receive today? Can you just like actually receive that truth as a revelation that your conscience, you know that thing in your head that causes you to flinch when you look back sometimes? Move on. The blood of Jesus either is sufficient or not sufficient to cleanse your conscience. It's, it's one or the other. Unbelief says it isn't. Belief says, I'm going to trust that because nothing else you could do with it. Oh, Jesus. Say this with me. Father God, I agree with you. I agree with your word. You're perfect. You're holy. I'm in Christ. I have your righteousness. 
I give you myself. I open myself. I ask you to finish the cleansing work in my heart, in my mind. And I trust you to set me free and take shame away from me. Lead me to healthy relationships, good fellowship, humble people, reciprocal people, loving people, and help me be a person of grace, a person of peace, and a person of mercy. I celebrate the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow. Hmm. Let's stand up together. That's good stuff, I think. I, I really, I really do. I think Jesus absolutely amazing what he did what he did what he's doing what he's going to do father bless your people as they go i pray that they would have a week where they focus on you they receive you their minds would be renewed they would walk in the freedom that you've already purchased on the cross for us in the name of jesus and everybody said Amen. Prayer partners, come on forward to get prayer, church. You're dismissed. How many of you are going to pray for me while I'm gone? 19 days. Thank you. Appreciate it. Love you.